it's gotten to the point where I won't even watch mainstream media or any news outlet. Both sides are against each other. Yeah. There's no center. Alrighty, folks, welcome back to Transacting Value, where we're encouraging dialogue from different perspectives to unite over shared values. Now, our theme for 2022 is the character of your character. So, who you see when you look your values in the mirror. Now, today we're talking our September core values of forgiveness, humility, and sacrifice with Mr. Christopher Kirk. For right now, if you're new to the podcast, welcome. And if you're a continuing listener, welcome back. Without further ado, folks, I'm Porter. I'm your host, and this is Transacting Value. All right, Chris, what's up, man? How you doing? How's it going? Pretty good. I'm glad you can make some time here this weekend to, to talk a little bit. So I appreciate you coming out, man. Thanks. Yeah, it's been a rough one. Well, how about today? Everything going a bit smoother, at least, all things considered? Yeah, pretty much. What? Wife and kids are out of town. They're up in Wisconsin right now. Is that where you're from? No, I'm originally from Illinois, but I grew up in Tennessee and then back in Illinois now. Oh, I see. Okay. Well, you know what? Let's just jump into that for a little bit. So I can obviously see you because we're talking on a video, but for everybody listening, let's work some relatability. So you mentioned you're from Illinois initially, raised in Tennessee, but what do you do now? What 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 has sort of shaped your perspective to this point? I just recently transitioned from the military in 2019. I was an infantryman in the army, did some reserve time, tried to balance work and military all in one with kids. So that was a task in itself. Yeah, um, currently, I uh, I run a CNC machine cutting flooring. Flooring? Yeah. Okay. Like for residential use? What does that mean? We do all sorts of stuff from gymnasium floors to commercial buildings to sports logos. Oh, 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 oh. like inlays for floors. Yeah, yeah. Yep. Okay. What are some of your most complicated projects that you've had to work through? We did one for the Wisconsin Badgers, their college locker room. That one was a nightmare. Lots of little pieces, basically a ginormous puzzle. Oh, yeah? Yeah. How long did that take to put it all together? From start to finish, anywhere from 20 to 30 hours. Jeez. Now you're talking piecing it together or design concept, cutting we and do, putting together. We do, we do the design concept, cutting, and then we lay it out ourselves, make sure everything's tight. And then from there, we send it to the customer. And so then if you're not local to where they're at, they do the assembly and install? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, we do no, we do no installs. We just uh, put it together at the shop and then go from there. Sweet. Okay, and so you've been doing that for the last couple of years now? Yeah, about four or five now. All right, yeah, good for you. How was that as an industry, I guess? Because I don't know anything about it, and it seems a little niche, you know, people that want custom floors or companies that want yeah, custom floors. Yeah, we do like rubber mats, like what you would see in a gym floor. Uh huh. We do that almost weekly. Oh, so that's pretty much your regular go-to type material? Yeah, logos are kind of a hit or miss. All right. How was it during COVID? Did you guys end up keeping as busy as normal or? Oh, we were open the entire time. Really? We never shut down once. The entire shop ended up getting COVID and we shut down for about a week or two and then ran counteracting shifts and nobody interacted with each other. That's busy. But it's only like a four person operation. We've got the owner, we've got the shop manager, we've got me and then another guy. Oh, that's your standard crew. That's it. That's nice. You don't have a lot of conflicting personalities to deal with. You don't have a right, lot of craziness. Right. Yeah, that's nice. And so you guys were able to stay regularly busy too. That helps a lot. Oh, yeah. We, if anything, we got busier. Really? Yeah. Oh, actually, I, I guess that makes a little sense. People staying home or, you know, office managers, whatever, being at work, just noticing things they want to update and change. Yeah. Right. Yeah. We're one of four, I believe, in the Midwest that do what we do. And we ship all over the U.S. Oh, dang. If you're that busy working all the time, you mentioned that you had to adjust, especially in 2019, once you got done and out of the military and then balancing work and life and family and your own self and whatever things you want to do and to relax or, or pursue. So if you're that busy at work, what kinds of things do you find work for you to balance out all of those priorities and your time? A lot of sleepless nights. 
<laughs> yeah. Yeah. That that's definitely the first thing to go, right? You start staying up late and waking up early. I mean, that was basically my routine in the military though. We would get maybe three hours of sleep if we were lucky. Whoa. Yeah, no wonder you stopped. You can't sustain that. Yeah. Jeez. Well, I ended up getting medically discharged. I blew out both of my knees twenty eighteen in Fort Polk, Louisiana. I had surgery on one, got a blood clot, and then they basically said that was it. I was the non deployable. Oh wow. Yeah. But I assume once that passes, you're you're back to normal? What does that mean? Not necessarily because I'm at risk for future clotting. Oh. So it kind of makes me a ailment to the mission. I see. I guess it would be one thing, one other thing to consider. Yeah. And so for your safety, if it's not worth it, it makes sense. Right. What's rehab like when you've got two legs that aren't working? Uh, it was a nightmare. So I got the first surgery, had all the complications, and I just said, screw it. I'm not going to do the other one. So I kind of <laughs> just... uh lean more onto that one than the other one the the one that had the surgery is actually worse than the bad one but now that i'm compensating with the other one to kind of take the weight of that one that one's starting to hurt a little bit more too yeah man compensation is tricky yeah tricky i've worked with some personal training clients at at gyms over the last couple years and that's sort of the biggest trend right you start to i guess people generally gravitate towards relative pleasure and away from pain or discomfort. So yeah, compensation's huge. And it's it, it may be minor, but over the course of a couple of years it just compounds. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And how are you getting around now? Pretty well? Fairly well. I had a little bit of atrophy in that leg too, just from sitting on the mm. couch so long with the quad and the surgery and everything else. Yeah. So my quad actually won't fire. I'm just now getting to the point in four years later where it's starting to somewhat grow and fire again but if i were to like lay straight i can't lift that leg straight up really yeah but walking and everything else is fine that's wild because you got to have a little bit of quad action to walk right man but like conscious effort you know moving forward you can catch yourself but wow right right if you're looking for high quality locally sourced groceries the keystone farmers market is the place to be alongside our signature homemade boiled peanuts We strive to offer only the best locally sourced pasta, baked goods, jams and jellies, farm eggs and dairy products, meats, and even seafood, as well as a great selection of fresh produce. That's the Keystone Farmer's Market, 12615 Tarpon Springs Road in Odessa, Florida. The place with the boiled peanuts. Really? Yeah, but walking and everything else is fine. That's wild because you got to have a little bit of quad action to walk. Right. Man. But like conscious effort, you know, moving forward, you yep. can catch yourself. But wow. Yeah, right, right. In May, we, we did an interview with, with a guy named Cody Anderson. One of the things actually that Cody taught me before he got out was this concept of a, it's called sliding filament theory. And so the gist is essentially what you just described with your quads not firing, but Whereas chemicals interact with the muscle fibers, whatever the muscle group is, they have these little filaments on the end that that sort of excite and stand up, and then they latch on to the next fiber above them, and then they ratchet and contract or release or whatever, like a ratchet strap. Well, they were giving giving me uh, electrotherapy for that to try and get it to do what you're saying. Yeah. Did it work? And even still couldn't get anything, no. Whoa. Yeah, see, I always thought that if a muscle group or whatever part of your body starts to atrophy, one, obviously visibly it gets smaller, but but two, it's just not necessary to be as strong. So it just right. cannibalizes itself. But I didn't realize that meant that it actually, what's the word? It de- actually de-energizes. stops yeah. yeah. Wow. I didn't know. And there's nothing you can do to mentally combat that. You just got to wait it really. out. Not really. I mean, I tried like just doing light squats and little jogs here and there and eventually like it's starting to build back now but yeah it's been about four years what's that like mentally i assume that takes a toll oh yeah it was hard for a while i was i couldn't even go from the couch to the restroom without being in pain or my leg would just completely give out 
And so you, you just have to rely on other people, but you got a whole family that you still got to take care of. Right. So like, could right. you drive? So I did my left leg for that purpose. So I could drive. Uh. Uh, that, that in itself was rough. I was in a huge brace that I couldn't even move in for two and a half months. Well, that's a long time. Yeah. I bet you got in some pretty quality movie time though. Oh yeah. <laughs> what are some of your go-to movies, man? Tombstone, Goodfellas, nice westerns, mafia movies. You know, I just watched. Uh, it's a Whitey Bulger documentary, not the movie. What is it? Black, black something. Or the other. biopic. Yeah, the actual biopic. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But it it's such a crazy story. How many different, like in his case, how many different law enforcement entities and how many different organizations and everybody had some role to play. But then he was just able in, in South Boston to manipulate everybody to his benefit. You know, it was like it was like watching a uh, what I expect a less maniacal Joker biopic to be. Yeah. Crazy. And then for, what was it, two and a half, three decades, just run in South Boston. Yeah. Yeah. But Tombstone's pretty cool, too. That's I, I think that's a classic, man. That one's wild. Oh, yeah, definitely, for sure. I actually had a chance to go down to the OK Corral in southern Arizona in Tombstone a couple years ago. Yeah. I mean, you know, it's nothing special. It's a bunch of rock wall and dirt, but it's yeah. still pretty cool though. Yeah. Have you had have you had a chance to travel anywhere or or go anywhere? Maybe even like that? Uh, not recently, no. Yeah. We don't do a lot of traveling. We're constantly working. Yeah, there's all sorts of cool places, man. And you mentioned Goodfellas too. You know, Ray Liotta just died a couple yeah. months ago. You remember right, about right, that? Yeah. Yeah. That was unfortunate too. I really liked him. He was young too. He was only like 70 something. Yeah. I don't think he was much older than that. Yeah. I can't yeah. remember. But let me ask you this. Only because you said you were raised in Tennessee and I'm extremely ignorant when it comes to a lot of things. My first, I guess, leaning goes to, okay, well then you must like country music. Is that a stereotype or is that fact? <laughs> Um, growing up, I didn't, I was forced to listen to it and I absolutely hated it. But, uh, <laughs> as I got older, I appreciated it a little more. Now, what aspect of country, what, I guess, almost now genre of country, like nineties, late eighties type country um, or like now more, I don't even know I what like it's called. I like the old outlaw country, Johnny Cash, mm. Merle Haggard, Waylon Jennings, not too crazy about any genre music past like 2005 now there there are some i, I don't want to say newer because they've been around a bit but more there's a few that i can get into but not yeah. very many like luke combs he's not that old hasn't yeah. been around that long yeah he's, but... a, he's a good one and uh morgan wallen that's another yep. one yep there's there's definitely a few you remember hearing what was it maybe two years ago i think it was morgan wallen got into that i don't even know if it's oh, a controversy, controversy but yeah yeah all that mess yeah, yeah. It's crazy now, in, in twofold, how quickly things can get blown out of proportion, but how quickly they can happen and get passed around and talked about, period. It's wild. Yeah, social media and media in general is just a huge problem right now. It can Everybody's be. offended by everything. and Yeah, there's definitely a lot of that, right? And you, you hear it all the time, whether you watch, I don't know, Tucker Carlson or, or whoever or not. Right. Um, it's, it's almost like everybody just, I don't know, takes sides. Like I, I don't know yeah, where the, I feel I feel in reality though most people are generally center they're not so far over one side or the other yeah but it's it's almost like to get any sort of social currency you have to pick a side right you know it's such a weird actually I guess it's not that weird I've seen Greece okay so let me back up have you seen Greece the movie the musical yeah 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 and so that's what I feel like it's it's Rydell High on prime time. You know, like right, yeah, absolutely. You're you're with them or you're not, and it's it's weird. And then now, I, I don't know that it ever died away, but this weird sort of back and forth thing with Biden and Trump. Not to dive into it, it's just interesting uh, between Biden and Trump. Like you guys aren't running against each other anymore, but they keep right reacting They're always to each popping other. up in the media. Yeah, yeah, but but to each other. Like what you do, you have right, no ties right. anymore. You know, exactly, man. But gets ratings. I guess. I mean, it seems to be working, you know, I mean, that whatever. Main street, yeah. Yeah. Everybody covers it. And, you know, I'll tell you, BBC, 
The Guardian. Yeah. Um, generally, both a little bit comparably more centered. I haven't seen any of that. Yeah. And it's super easy to get sucked into these hot button hashtag issues of the day here in the States and get tunnel vision on, all right, well, then there's nothing else happening. It's gotten to the point where I won't even watch mainstream media or any news outlet. Both sides are against each other. Yeah. There's no center that most of America. Hey y'all, it's Jules here with the Bee and the Bear Creations. We specialize in custom tumblers, t-shirts, car decals, and anything else you can think of. If you are looking to order a custom item for yourself or for someone else as a gift, please go find me on Facebook and shoot me a message and we'll get that order started for you. Again, you can find me at The Bee and the Bear Creations on Facebook. I look forward to helping you create your custom item. Both sides are against each other. Yeah. There's no center that most of America. I think so. Yeah. And it it doesn't even have to be politically driven, right? Like you don't have to be libertarian or democratic or Republican or whatever else exists now. I don't know. Like just as people, you know what I mean? Like, right. What do you, yeah. Let let me, let me, let me ask you this and you answer it as as in depth or or be as vulnerable as you want. Uh, It's entirely up to you. When you think about anything, I'm, I don't want to say political, but like when you were in school, right? High school or college, whatever applies in your case. When you were in school, how many times did you side with the popular vote, you know, like to get vending machines in every classroom with the new class president or like, right. I'm only with the sports team and the jocks because that's what groups do. Or did you just do your own thing? I was kind of doing my own thing. Like we were in a super small high school. Football was king. Yeah. I played all four years, but I was also the guy that had the freaking big gauges in my ear too <laughs> that didn't fit in at all with anyone yeah but no i uh i was hanging out with everybody it's such a weird thing that like when does that change or maybe it doesn't and it just sort of gets masked over i don't know but it seems like it does everybody who rides sort of down the line where you're describing you're not the outcast but you're not the popular crowd where do you go as an adult when does that change what's the threshold i think the military was a big part of that for me because everybody's in unison there's no cliques there's no groups yeah it is a hard reset black white hispanic everybody just meshed together because we all depended on one another yeah well that's sort of the difference right like in the regular world private sector whatever you want to call it you don't have to rely on anybody you can do your own thing right as long as you're not murdering people and running stop signs or anything in between you're good usually yep that's exactly how i feel as long as you're not affecting me or anyone else do you yeah but do you think that might be contributing to some of this division oh a hundred percent so is that a problem i feel like it's becoming a problem i don't think it's we're there yet but it's becoming so in whatever direction applies as a fix and i'm quoting that for anybody listening how do we fix it then Honestly, I have no idea. Like, I feel like we're just going downhill and it doesn't matter who's in office, what's going on. Like, crime rate here in Chicago is just ridiculous. Higher than just normal over or th- usual? Oh, yeah. Just over 4th of July, my buddy was uh, on the fire department when the uh, mass shooting happened at the grave. And then I just saw on Facebook, like, two weeks ago, there was a shooting at Six Flags. Yeah, but I mean, is that... Like in the 90s, right? Kids can't play these games because it's going to incite school violence. And is it because of video games? Is it, is it really because Pokemon Go is corrupting our youth? You know, like, what do you think? <laughs> I mean, I think maybe video games do have a part to play in it. But also, our movies, our television, everything is ruled around guns. But it's exciting. Oh, it's definitely exciting. I'm not going to lie. I love it. But, uh, no, I think... Our media in general contributes to all that. Yeah, but I mean, they're they're a business, right? So as far as business goes, they're just trying to keep up ratings and cater to what's popular. And I mean, that's all anybody does usually, right? Like, right. like we, we started with politicians. They're obviously going to say what they can to get a popular vote and win the competition, get elected. But Absolutely. That doesn't necessarily mean that's them as people or that's what's true right. to them and their ideals. Maybe it is. Maybe it's not. I don't know. Uh, hey, if there's ever any sitting president or senator that wants to be on his podcast, send me an email. If you don't cater to your base, you're going to lose support. 
And then Absolutely. how do you get elected? To say that everybody has something unique to bring to the table, whatever that means in your circumstance or application here, to say that everybody's opinion is has merit or is valid, but then to say, all right, well, yeah, but to win this competition, to get elected, to fill in the blank that involves anything popular, spreading on social media, for example, causing any sort of unity for a company or gaining consumers or selling products. Right? You've right. got to give people what they want. Ratings on TV, video games, movies. Sort of like Steve Jobs said, right? How do people know what they want if I haven't told them yet? I don't even know how to describe it. It's a weird kind of threshold where you've got to cater to people on one hand without sacrificing maybe your values, your corporate culture, your character, your sense of you authentically. I don't know where that middle ground is. I guess we're all sort of finding right. it out as we go though, right? Absolutely. It's a tricky balance. And then now, man, now you don't even have to be you. You remember watching Catfish on MTV a while ago? Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. I mean, it was funny then, but now it's reality. I mean, more than then. Right. You can be, a, I don't know how into computers you are. You can be a character on a computer game and be a 55-year-old man, but be a 12-year-old girl in the game. Yep. I'm, I mean, now, I don't know. Now there's a little bit of that uh, in, in, it seems like, every game, TV show, movie, where yeah. where where people are, I don't know, pretending? Yeah, it, does, it seems that way more now than ever. Yeah, I, but it's it's the it's becoming the mainstream popularity point. Right. Inclusion, creativity, maybe you being authentic to you, it means you being someone else. And then, so that's one angle. What do you think about this other angle? I was tossing this around. Let me get your opinion. In elementary school, did you ever have library time? Uh, yeah. Yeah, I think we went like weekly. Yeah, something like that, right? Where you sit down, librarian yeah. teaches you the Dewey Decimal System, and she reads you a book, and you take a nap, maybe, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Well, what do you think books are the same thing? Like, are we really that far now from where we were then? You read a book to escape reality. You create a character honestly, to escape it. I honestly don't even think that people read as often as they used to. Maybe not. I mean, you don't need to as much now. No, everything. Well, I mean, I know me personally. I probably haven't picked up a book since high school. I listen to a lot of audio books, though. Yeah. Well, and a lot of that's the same the same vein, right? It's still just basically somebody reading to you. Right. Yeah. So um, there's, there's nothing wrong with that. But I think we have kind of lost that a little bit, and it's moved over into media. Well, what about... People aren't as influenced by books and narratives and everything else as they are media. That's a fair point. Okay, I agree with you. But then what about times have changed so much? People, I don't know, aren't like they used to be or, or whatever type references you want to make saying like, okay, so the Swiss Family Robinson. To read a book for entertainment, you're really just taking a break to escape from whatever reality you're in. 100%, yeah. Is it really that different now? Kids doing the same thing, making video game characters or people, I guess, making video game characters? escape into reality no in? no i think it's entirely the same well okay so how did your parents or you with your family or whichever discourage you from okay like you can read books about magic but you're not a wizard okay you need right. to learn reality <laughs> how do you teach that then yeah that's a that's a good point i never really thought of it that way i had a, i had a teacher in school maybe it was high school uh, or secondary school for anybody listening but I had a teacher, so I was reading one of the books in the Harry Potter series. It, it came out around that time, that book. I remember he walked over to me, and he said, just, you you believe that? I said, believe it? No, but it it's fun to read, and I know it's not yeah, real. It's so I hard to <laughs> differentiate fiction from nonfiction anymore. Yeah, but oh, that's a valid point, too. There is a difference, though, and maybe that's just what we've lost. Maybe that's why reading or reinvigorating the importance of it is could be so much help so much more helpful. But like you have kids? Yeah, I've got two. Okay, so I've got one. He's eight. He doesn't want to learn how to read. Yeah. That's how my seven year old is. Yeah. Okay. So yeah, same like, he absolutely hates school. Because it's not fun. Right. I think a lot of that because our kids are the same age is because mine was doing kindergarten during COVID. So oh. it was all online when you're supposed to be interacting and everything else. Yeah. So I think that played a big part in it. But I think also we got to take a step back as parents and be like, all right, well, 
I didn't think school was fun either, and I didn't have half the distractions they've got now. Right. You've got to be able to take fix. the time to make them read. Essentially. Right. Right. Or, yeah. or make them realize that there's a difference at least. Yeah. Yep. And then now, man, I'll tell you what, dude. Now YouTube. Let's just say and nothing against YouTube. Nothing against any of these people making these channels. Oh yeah, it's but, not allowed at this house though. That's probably smart. Every time I catch my kids on it, all right, you're losing your phone, you're losing the tablet. You never know what's gonna pop up. No. They've got the kids they've got the kids YouTube, but I've seen like adult content on that. International Podcast Day is September thirtieth, and you can help spread the word. You may be asking, what can I do to get involved? It's pretty simple. Head over to internationalpodcastday.com and check the suggestions. Then use hashtag International Podcast Day to join the conversation. You can reach out and connect with other podcasters, listeners, and your favorite podcast hosts. Remember September 30th, International Podcast Day, a day-long celebration of the power of podcasts. And nothing against YouTube, nothing against any of these people making these channels. Oh, yeah, it's not allowed at this house, though. That's probably smart. Every time I catch my kids on it, all right, you're losing your phone, you're losing the tablet. You never know what's going to pop up. No. They've got the kids, they've got the kids YouTube, but I've seen like adult content on that. Well, it still comes down to whoever's moderating or whoever's uploading to say, right. no, it's kid friendly. But then, so you've got videos on YouTube that are fabricated for the sake of YouTube and ratings. Right. Right. So th- these types of people, commentators, if you will, talking about Minecraft or whatever other video games, people just watching them play video games, these types of channels, though, all of that is not real. Some of it is people playing video games. It's all gameplay. But right. the reactions, there's a, there's a show on Netflix. What's it called? Magic for Humans. Have you seen this? No. It's 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 a good show. Dude, I can't remember his name now. Uh, but anyway, the, the guy's a, a magician, mostly a street magician from what he does on the show. And then he turned it into a TV show, right? So you see okay. that. Yeah, so it's it really cool. He does a great job with it. Is I don't know how many seasons now, but there, it is a series on, I think, Netflix. So the first time I watched that with my son, he thought it was super cool. And I agree. And I don't want to dissuade him from thinking magic is cool because the illusion, it, right. it, you know, it is. It's cool. And it helps right. m- maintain some creativity and, and whatever. But, but there's a difference when it's on TV. Like, yeah. I can't explain the tricks, but... I can explain that if there's a cut take somewhere that you cut out or even impractical jokers is another one. Like you can't do all these things without giving somebody a heads up, but on TV you can make it look like they don't know. Right. Cause you that edit all that been out. Going on like 15 years. They're yeah. obviously going to know, Oh, these guys are here. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. But it doesn't seem that way on TV. It doesn't seem that way on YouTube. Right. So right. now to say, Hey dude, look, this is nonfiction because it can happen. It does happen. But in this moment, in this video, it didn't actually happen that way. Like you almost have to discredit what people are seeing now to explain the reality and the nonfiction of certain things. That's tough. That's tough. Oh, yeah. You're not, I don't know, sacrificing reality to say that this. Not that this can't happen, but it's not happening in this moment. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And that's a tough point to teach from because now what sort of stable ground are you using as a platform to teach? Absolutely, um, man. E- even outside of school, just just as a parent or as an adult, as a human, for that matter, talking to other people, like, right. A lot of languages are rooted in religion, it's just because how it started, and then it carried through. Yeah. <laughs> a lot of new words, like Urban Dictionary type stuff, aren't. Yeah. They're they're rooted in popular culture, but to say that they're not words, well, if you use them and people interpret the meaning and it's effective and correct, well, now it's a word, you know. Right. I think it's the same sort of thing where I think overall we're facing this destabilization of morals as a society and it's going to get introduced as the new norm. It's it's absolutely that's just the pattern of life and, and time and history. Now do you think with them removing all of this history and everything else, you think history will repeat itself? Maybe not specific okay. events. Right? Like we're not I don't expect we're gonna have another French and Indian war, right? Right. But there's trends in the same vein that there's scientific theories because they've stood time, even though circumstances have changed and technologies have improved. I think it'll be the same case where throughout history, people who get greedy, there will always be greedy people. Right. And and land, resources, power will always be a focus of that greed. There's always going to be a minority and a majority of what's popular and what's not. 
somebody's always going to be oppressed compared to somebody else. You can't make everybody happy, right? On those larger, more sort of meta scale type things. But even I think on a lower degree, the tactics that people fought in wars or the reason that people went to battle, how people sustained a livelihood during the Revolutionary War who weren't fighting in the war. Was all of that actually based on race? I don't know. I wasn't there. I only know what's in books. That doesn't necessarily mean that it matters. I don't want to trivialize it. And it was important. But right now, present day today, if you're going to explain that things in the past are based exclusively on race, and that was the entire motivating factor, and that's why we should have reparations now or should teach things a certain way in school, well, then you also have to teach that maybe it wasn't. Maybe it wasn't based on race. Maybe that's not why we should have reparations now. Maybe economically reparations are a bad idea because this budget concern, this, that, and the other, and it has nothing to do with race. Maybe we should also talk about in schools then, if we were to teach that. Okay, well, it is also important to forgive and move on. It is also important to learn how to deal with conflict and how to cope, as opposed to, and no offense to people bringing this up, but as opposed to three generations back, my grandfather was sexually assaulted by a slave owner. Right. Okay, got it. And I, I, I get it. But like, there are other things we can teach through that instead of just stopping there too. So I don't know, man. Uh, yes is the short answer. I think history is going to repeat itself, whether it, it exists in writing or not. Because of all the events that have happened in history, not all of them get written down for every detail that existed. Right. I don't know. What do you think? I'm, I'm on the same page as you with that one. I think it definitely will repeat. Obviously, not to the extent that it did, but I think deleting history is just going to make it reappear. Yeah. I mean, if anything, it makes it harder to find, so it doesn't reappear. Right, right. It's such a weird cycle, but good luck telling that to anybody. Absolutely, yeah. Man, you'll get reamed online or in person. Even if you agree with them. Yeah. And that's the tricky part, I think, establishing commonalities. And once you can do that, generally, you can carry a civil conversation. Without a doubt, yeah. Yeah. But, Chris, speaking of civility, that actually brings us to the last segment of the show. It's called Developing, Developing Character. character. Developing, character. Developing Character. Ready to play? Let's do it. All right, man. Here's how it works. I'm going to ask you three questions. Each of them are from your perspective and entirely within your perspective, right? To answer as in-depth or be as vulnerable as you prefer to be. Question number one. What were some of your values that you had as a teenager? That's taking me way back. Our, um, <laughs> <laughs> I would definitely say loyalty was a strong one for me. I was always loyal to my friends, always going above and beyond to help somebody if I could. And I still carry that one today. That one's real strong with me. Punctuality was always a good one for me. I didn't necessarily always get places on time, but <laughs> I always I always made sure... I uh, made the attempt to be there early and on time. That's all you can do, right? At least make the attempt. All right, so question two you touched on a little bit, but I'm going to ask you anyway. So currently now, what are some values you try to embody and spread to other people? Generosity. I always try and give when I can. Always trying to help somebody if they need it. Loyalty. Got same group of friends for the most part that I did back then. That goes a long way too, that stability in your life. Yep. So then question three, how do you see your values changing, say, over the next 20 years? I don't know. That's a tough one. Everything's constantly changing. You never know what values you're going to continue to hold or grow into. Oh, well, so then is it fair to say open-mindedness is going to stay on the list? <laughs> I'd say that's a fair <laughs> assumption. All right, man. Well, hey, look, I appreciate it uh, making some time in your day, obviously, to come out and, and talk a little bit and then just Really, honestly, man, being willing to talk and have a conversation about some topics that might otherwise be a little contentious or where you got to be a little vulnerable. So uh, thank you. I appreciate it. No problem. Thank you. Yeah, man. Hey, Chris, I want to ask you, man, before we get out of here and before we close up this interview, two questions. One, if anybody wants to get in touch with you for any reason or to reach out for topics or just somebody to talk to, how can they? How do you prefer that they do that? And two, are there any other organizations or anything that you want to give a shout out to and bring up while you're on the air? Social is kind of the best option. Facebook is really the only one I've got. But yeah, you could drop a link at 
anytime if anyone wants to reach out. Also, any veterans, check out Irreverent Warriors. Get in on one of their hype silky marches. I saw that. What is it? Irreverentwarriors.com, I think? I want to say, yeah. yeah. I should have uh, should have researched before, but <laughs> definitely an awesome organization. Veterans only, or veterans or active duty, right, can participate in their hikes, and you just hike around, have a good time, and basically just a giant tailgate? Absolutely. It's a good time. Yeah, that's pretty much it. They have marches all over the country. They uh, combat veteran suicide by these marches. Oh, that's their platform. It's not like a gathering of let's hang out and get to know each other. I mean, it's that too. Like I've met so many awesome people through them, but it's mostly to bring veterans together and combat veteran suicide. That's huge. No offense, but I think it can definitely do a lot more than 22 push-ups a day. So Absolutely. Yeah, so that's cool. Get people to reach out and give them a platform to do it. Yeah, well, for everybody listening, make a note, or Irreverent Warriors, they'll be tagged in the post for this interview as well, so you guys will be able to find them there. Click on the link, go to the website, reach out, and maybe even schedule a hike in your area if it's not already coming to you. But yeah, Chris, I appreciate it, man. Thank you. All right, dude, we'll be in touch. Sounds good. And for anybody else, thank you for listening in to our core values for September, where we talked about forgiveness, humility, and sacrifice. And uh, also, this may be a little bit of a stretch, but I'd like to thank a little bit Outlaw Country as a genre, specifically Tombstone, because you took me back there for a second, Chris, and then Ray Liotta, rest in peace, but all of those for your inspiration, among a few other topics, to our show partners, Keystone Farmers Market, the Bee and the Bear Creations, and uh, Anchor and Buzzsprout for your distribution. So if you're interested in joining our conversation, or if you want to discover our other interviews, check out transactingvaluepodcast.com. And remember, you can follow along on social media too. While we continue to stream new interviews every Monday at 9 a.m. Eastern Standard Time on all your favorite podcasting platforms. If necessary, you can also jump onto any search engine, search either Survival Dad YT or Transacting Value Podcast, and you'll be able to find all of our links there as well. But until next time, that was Transacting Value.